first to give a keynote is Sarah Bracking. <coughs> Good morning. So please, Sarah. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, so good, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah uh, Bracking and I work at King's College London. Um, I'm a critical geographer. Um, I study um, geographical finance. Um, I'm a trained political economist. And I've basically looked at climate finance. So I'm not so much in the um, biodiversity part of this debate, but I have been watching the climate debate from way back. <laughs> Show my age. So... Um, in climate change, uh, there's been a big push to quantification and the use of metrics. Mostly the metric um, tons of carbon emissions avoided. So the whole world has become part of a carbon imaginary where you know, everything we do can be denominated in carbon. And this is to mitigate and take out carbon from the atmosphere to prevent global warming. Today, I'm going to talk on these just three quick themes. Um, the first one is what I'm concerned about most, which is how much of this big debate, all this socio-technical arrangement, is actually real. You know, where, where the, to use a horrible metaphor, where the tyre hits the road, it's very masculine, sorry, but how much of what we see in the spectacle of money is actually transfers to a material change in the way humans and nature and the planet entangle or relate. That's my biggest sort of scientific concern on a, on a daily basis. You will notice as I go forward that I'm more on the spectacle side. I think the climate finance debate tends to a performance of care for the benefit of overconsumption, as in sort of us, mostly. Um, I study the, I do understand finance a bit. I'm not a, you know, a, a big money person, but I do go through the paperwork, say, of the Green Climate Fund or the Green Gilts, and I try and work out how much money is actually spent on things and how much is a white-collar industry, how much goes to consultancy, technical documentation. Um, and then the second point I'm going to make is about financialization. Um, and then the third one about, if not the private sector, who is going to help us out of this unfolding crisis? So this is the great metric of climate change, CO2 emissions avoided, and it generates extremely complex um, equations. And one of the problems with the carbon imaginary is its complexity. So if you take that into the financial industries, you have banks saying, we can't get to exact numbers. It's very expensive for us to find out how much a transition bond reduces carbon or how much a green bond you know, creates an emissions pathway. What is just enough science is a key question here. Whereas for natural scientists, you know, we could find out the difference between seagrass and kelp. But is that actually going to help all those resources in there? Or is there another sort of step change that we need? In terms of nature, um, I like this graphic. It's from an organization that are looking at um, biodiversity. You can see there, they turn it into little squares of earth. And I think this metric is one that you're more familiar with, the mean species abundance metric, which has as its denominator a unit of forest. And then other units of things are made commensurate with a unit of forest, which if you're a desert-based person would be a bit of an affront. I mean, we love trees, but not everyone loves trees. So this thing about making units of nature commensurate is something that we've been doing with carbon and climate change for some time. And my colleague, Sean summed it up um, quite a few years ago now, that for capitalism to deal with a crisis, it has to see nature in terms that it can understand. And this is where all these metrics come from. So you have to pacify a piece of carbon reduction or a piece of nature. You have to frame it. You have to make it unlive. You have to make it commensurate with other units of live things. And then you have to financialize it. So this is one example, the carbonated tiger. I use this with my students. You might think this is an energy drink or a nightclub, um, but it's actually a forest project in Nepal where you take the whole forest and you denominate it in carbon in order to also make it into a biodiversity offset. So in the logic of finance, you can see the forest has become an asset from which there are now several derivative income streams. 
not just the one for carbon sequestration, but also the one for a biodiversity offset. So the making of assets from nature um, is, is the way forward. Now, in terms of climate finance, this is a quite a complex diagram I didn't do, CPI did this, about all the money in the system, which in this year was 632 million. If you look at the second column at the top, grants are 36 billion. That's actually climate finance that's not a loan. That's all, less than a tenth. Less than a tenth of climate finance is also put for adaptation, say, for the people in Pakistan. Um, who are drowning underwater. Um, so, in other words, climate finance as a spectacle is a very, very big number, which if you disaggregate it, translates to a very small number that's actually given away as a grant or for adaptation. So it's a debt-based system of accumulation. Um, but it's aimed at uh, mitigating this finance gap. So the bottom line there is how much we're spending on climate finance. This is what they're talking about in COP. And the big green bit is how much that it's calculated that we should be spending. And there is a, a big gap. Now, not only is there a big gap, but if you disaggregate, because of time, I'm not going to do everything on the slides. I'm, I'm assuming that you can pause the video or look at them later. <laughs> Um, if you look at ODA mobilised by the public sector, it's been financialized. So a lot of it is aid leaning, you know, in its classification system. So it's the classification of the money that makes it climate finance. But you look at the form of the money in an anthropological financial sense, it takes these private sector forms, shares in sieves, um, shares in offshore equity, and, but it's still counted. So even that headline figure really is a bit of a stretch because it's still private sector money acting in the private sector by private sector actors. And the only inflection of green is a self-label by them. So is this a debt-based transition or climate justice and equity? My argument would be that it's debt-based. But not only that, sorry, so green bonds... Um, are they really a great achievement? There's plenty of graphs out there. If you look on the internet, um, all the financial platforms will be talking about the increase in green bonds. Um, but it's still really small. It's about 1% of all assets under management globally. It is now more than 3 trillion US. And it's a debt-based accumulation. And these net zero graphs, this is one from the UK, the six carbon budget, count us towards net zero, but in the case of the UK, by offshoring the counting of finance to um, places where it's produced. So in the UK, we count consumption footprint, which is rather disingenuous, because the people that are making the stuff are not in the equations. So let's go back to the green bonds. What's green in a green bond? Um, because of what you use it for and because you say it is. So these are self-labeled products. If you call something a green bond, you are trying to attract a new group of investors to your product. Now, you may have to conform to um, an ICMA green bond principles, but all this means is you have to put it into a category of activity that you can see as vaguely green. So electric cars, roof insulation, new buildings, roads. And these categories are a lot. There's a, there's a lot of these categories. So if you look at the UK green, bill, green bond and ask how much is spent on green projects, and you go into that, you find that there's a fungibility between things that used to be brown that have been reclassified such that the government can inflate the concept of its spending on green spending. So all sorts of things from other departmental portfolios have been added into the list of eligible projects to get to these big um, headline figures. In fact, the disclaimer from the UK Green Guilt, this is from the technical document, for me says it all, because the disclaimer basically says we don't promise any investor that this is green at all and you can't take us to court if you prove it not to be so. So it is self-labelled in a real spectacle type sense. In fact, there is no current clear definition of green. So we are talking about a very movable and amorphous feast. I'm below the 10 minutes. 
In terms of financialization, you can see here how um, we're using financial concepts and financial forms of calculation in order to apply them to the climate change debate by making these assets with derivative income streams, the fourth definition, and by our use of financial language in, in the process of policy change. The private sector think it's a revolutionary moment. If you go to webinars from the private sector, they're very upbeat, you know. Will labelling stuff be enough? Yes, of course it will. It's simple, we just need to decarbonise. I sort of stalk business webinars as part of my research process. It's not called stalking, it's called digital participant observation. But <laughs> basically, um, and, and I sort of document how they're talking about that. With disclosure and targets, the private sector is saying, we can do this. Um, so I'm going to get to the very last slide. So green bonds um, relate investing or spending money to this financing gap, but promise a new debt fueled period of capital accumulation, the, the, the Green New Deal. Our problem is, is that accumulation of debt really going to lead to the enough green assets to make the difference? And carbon has never dropped. Carbon emissions have never dropped. In fact, we're years off a peak. So all this future pegging and future thinking and things by 2040, things by 2050, is all a spectacle because in the now and in the past, we've done a neg negligible nothing. And it's important to keep remembering that. This way of financializing nature also locks in ideas of change with ideas of investing money and accumulating debt. That's paradigmatically problematic for, for social science and for the, you know, communities in general. Transformational change is something else. We have to change the way humans, more than human species and nature, relate to each other. But in that, I might be talking to the... Uh, to, to people who already realise. So change at scale would come with regulatory and mandatory law. I don't think the finance sector can solve this problem, is the conclusion. And sorry for overrunning. <laughs> Please stay if you oh. want to take a question or two. Oh, I see, yeah. yes, sorry. <laughs> would you like to start? Mm -hmm. yeah, I could do that, mm -hmm. yes. Or should I? So, so <laughs> you, uh, I think you highlighted some serious mm -hmm. weaknesses here. Um, mm -hmm. But do you see, are there any positive signs? Mm. I think that the, the positive sign is happening um, inherently in the market anyway. But it's not because of the reclassification and the efforts to go green. It's because the cost of solar photovoltaic cells and renewables has dropped below the cost of coal. So yep. everything, and this year has been a boon year because unfortunately of a war. But all the carbon emissions that have happened, which are very, very positive, are not necessarily related to this spectacle of moving green that mm. we're trying to be sponsored. So some of the best um, green assets don't even bother to call themselves a green bond. They're pure play anyway. Mm. Everybody knows that an electric car is an electric car. Mm. So what I've been talking about is that effort to make all the other assets look green mm. when they may not be. So, yeah. Movements yeah. in the market may be doing more than is suggested by this. How, how could we make climate finance really green and not self-labeled green? I mean, the mm. final remark you had was regulation, mandatory legislation. Is that a way or what would yeah. you have on your wish list when it comes to really greening climate change? Okay, so... In terms of the private sector, the green bonds, um, the regulatory framework has to be a lot stricter. Mm. But also um, the stranded assets, the oil and gas, the fossil fuels, just needs to be stopped. So regulators have to be much, much more ambitious. There's no grandfathering process still possible. So in terms of the private sector, the private sector has to work in the market that they find themselves in. Governments regulate that market. And if it wasn't for neoliberal no. sort of self-denying ordinance that politicians don't do their job anymore, no. those politicians could sort out that market. In terms of the public sector, climate finance, I think it should go to reparations, loss and damage, mm -hmm. and historical debt, because my biggest concern is the 600 million people who are starving or drowning 
and we're not dealing um, effectively with our international solidarity for those people. Yeah. So I'm. So you've been stalking or <laughs> yeah. observing this for a long time. Uh, but w what do you make of it? Because I guess I mean the the people working on this uh, are serious about it and sincere with what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and at the same time, we have a reality which is not moving in the right direction so are do these people have split personalities or how should we mm. understand um, i think my, th this debate is more on a on a structural frame of reference i mean the motivations of individual equity managers or portfolio managers i wouldn't want to comment on i'm sure that there's many who are very good in intentioned but i think what they're doing can only be incremental and mm. quite negligible because in the same banks you know on a different floor you have the oil and gas investors and then you know on the floor above or below metaphorically speaking yeah. you have the green asset investors and while they may make a lot of noise about being good and you know they might be really good people. That's not really the issue. The point is, overall, the financial sector is not moving assets at anything like um, a fast enough pace. Mm. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>